Hello fanatics, welcome to another murder, mystery and kitten up Sunday. Yes, we are kitten up. Um, I'm actually kitten up a very old DIY moon shop kit. It's very, very cute, but yeah, I'm kind of working through my private stash but here she is it is alice that's what we're kitting up um it comes it came on a, a canvas legend so i just used my labels uh, to kit up and that is that kit i am working on it look at this do you remember these packets oh it's gonna take me a while but that's a good thing because I have, well, I'm here, okay, and it is Sunday and it's true crime and I'm about to ruin your Sunday. I'm just putting it out there. Today, your Sunday is going to be ruined. I found a despicable human to talk about. Um, I've never actually heard of this guy so it's going to be very interesting. I tell you, uh, I tell you, I, I do try and try and find the despicable, you know. But I'm just putting out there today, your Sunday is going to be ruined. So while I'm just kitting this up, um, it's going to be a hot mess because I have duplicate packets and they're all in them little packets. They're not even, um, you know, on a thread. They're just, it's chaos. But that's okay. That's okay. We can do it. We can kid up and we can talk about a true crime. I am going to be talking about a serial killer today. Oh my gosh, this individual. So, just for clarification, okay, a serial killer is typically a person who murders three or more people in two or more separate events over a period of time. So it could be over weeks, over days, over months, or even years. This guy, this guy, um, his span of crimes ranged from 1992 to 1999. That is seven years. And I'm fully aware that seven years is quite a long time. But it's also not um, to commit the crimes that he did. Okay, so you know what to do by now. You grab your project, okay? You grab a drink. I've got a cup of tea on the go. Of course I do. Um, but today we are going to be talking about Louis... Alfredo Garavito is how I'm going to pronounce it. Now he is Colombian, so yeah, I I might well be butchering that, but that's what I'm going to go with. I'm just going to call him Louis, just because I can say it easier. So he was born on the 25th of January in 1957. And uh, he he is a very gross individual. Okay, so with my true crime, I do like to go back to the early life because I'm always curious of the tipping point or what made someone snap to the point of becoming despicable because we've... If we're honest with ourselves, we, we've all seen, we all know people in our lives who have pushed us to the breaking point, okay? And 
you kind of just, you know, reach out your hands to like, Ugh. but we don't actually do it. These people, they have kind of a switch. But this person, okay, so early life. Louis and his siblings were neglected. He described his father as a, quote, womanizer, and his parents fought frequently. He claimed he, quote, had the misfortune of being in a family that spent its time arguing, fighting, and throwing words of great caliber, end quote and that his father was physically abused, that dad physically abused the family. Consequently, Louis and his siblings hid from their father. As a child, he shared the bed with his father and and speculated that he was fondled. Louis claimed his strict father only brought him for work-related purposes and errands that his father frequently berated him. He was ridiculed by other children at school and struggled to learn subjects. He was nicknamed Squiggle because of his glasses. Louis eventually preferred playing alone at recess, acting out aggressively towards students who chased and mocked him by screaming squiggle at him. This apparently distressed Louis and he resented his dad because, you know, yeah coming from a a home where there's abuse you're kind of already broken when you're going into school so you kind of blame the home life around 1968 louis alleged he was pulled out of fifth grade by his father to financially sustain their family and that he was discouraged from making friends and interacting with girls In 1969, he was fondled by a devoutly religious pharmacist and neighbour on his father's visits to the store for Louis' vaccinations. The pharmacist was close to his dad and allegedly bit him, burnt him and cut him during sexual abuse. The severity of this abuse and Louis's other claims of extreme abuse were later questioned by several experts and interviewers. Following the first incident of his abuse, Louis allegedly killed and dissected two birds out of frustration. Adolescence. After stoning the birds, Louis suggested to his younger brothers and sisters that they sleep with him naked in their shared bed. He then fondled his younger siblings as they slept on multiple occasions after removing their clothes. Louis also alleged he fondled a six-year-old boy in 1969. According to those who knew him, Louis became very withdrawn, extremely aggressive and ready to take revenge on the world. The pharmacist's sexual abuse ended after the family's relocation in 1971 and rendered Louis sexually impotent with women and permanently unable to perform, you know. He did not disclose this experience 
until adulthood, for fear his family would not believe him. Louis was allegedly shown heterosexual pornography by another neighbouring family friend because he responded with disgust. Louis was beaten into the undergrowth and assaulted. In 1972, he aggressively attempted to initiate sexual relations with several women. Through his family, Louis increasingly consumed alcohol. First being evicted in 1972 after his mother caught him attempting to rape a five-year-old boy and again in 1973 after an attempted assault on a six-year-old boy at a train station. The six-year-old boy screamed and Louis was briefly detained, explaining he only wanted to lightly molest the child in response to an attempted rape charge. Following the six-year-old boy, um, Louis claimed he was reprimanded by his father for not choosing a woman to sexually assault instead of a young boy. As a result, their frequent fighting ended up in him being evicted for the final time for, quote, homosexual behaviour. Louis started working as an assistant at a compensation fund and later in a chain of stores and studied marketing. Despite his newfound career, he developed problems with co-workers, clients and bosses, which escalated to physical altercations. After losing his job, he worked as a street vendor who sold religious icons and as a migrant worker, developing platonic friendships with various women over the course of his adulthood. In 1973, Louis began work on a coffee plantation and he first started falling in love with a school teacher and a single mother named Mary, we're just going to call her Mary, whom he later attended weekly mass services with. Many of his close female associates had children, whom Louis reportedly nurtured as if they were his own and was a good boyfriend when sober. His companions likewise described him to be amicable, despite his notably violent temper and occasional drunken states in which he vowed to murder his father. While drunk, Louis was physically abusive towards his girlfriends as well as increasingly jealous, controlling and belittling. As a result, he was often the subject of local scandals and town gossip, facing repeated evictions by female partners later in life. In the 1970s, heading into adulthood now, Louis suffered symptoms of psychosis, paranoia and depression. And he began compulsively molesting both male and female children, developing an almost exclusive preference for boys. Mm. Due to his depression and suicidal feelings related to his lack of achievement, he expressed a desire to start a family and insisted on having sexual intercourse with his female partners when drunk. Despite this, Louis suffered from dysfunction 
which caused him extreme grief and he often ranted of his hatred for his family to them. Louis was an alcoholic and began participating in Alcoholics Anonymous AA. Uh, He was joining them meetings in 1978, converting to the Pentecostal faith and working as a clerk at a store where he reconnected with his first girlfriend, Mary. Drifting from his family, he was only close to his older sister, Esther, who avoided him due to his alcoholism. Louis also had conflict with his younger siblings over their father's favour to them. Relocating to the town of Armenia, he acquired a new job at a local bakery. Louis frequently visited church where he would beat his chest during prayer attending AA meetings and occasionally seeing psychiatrists before ending his day by frequenting Valencia Park to procure the services of child prostitutes. This is one massive just conflict. Like, which is it? Are you going to church to be a better person? Then you're going to Valencia Park to procure the services of child prostitutes. He keeps reloading and he's going to AA and and psychiatrists and still doing all of this. It's a lot. After allegedly provoking a fight with his co-workers, Louis' employment at the bakery was terminated. He subsequently attempted suicide. Following this failed attempt, Louis sought psychiatric care at a hospital and was repeatedly hospitalised throughout the spring of 1980, where he expressed a desire to die over a belief that his life was worth nothing. He was primarily treated for his diagnosed depression in spite of evident psychosis and bulimia and was however prescribed antipsychotic medication. Intent on explaining why he was suicidal, Louis stated he wanted to have children before misdirecting this statement into implying he wanted to start a family. Choosing not to inform the psychiatrists of his paedophile tendencies or his sexual impotence with female partners. And this beggars belief really because if you're trying to get help then you kind of have to be honest but You know, they're only treating half the problem, right? Louis later obtained employment in 1980 at a supermarket, being given a two-hour lunch break on Thursday and Sunday afternoons. He then began a short-lived relationship with a single mother and beautician named Claudia, whom he described as being his first woman whose company he enjoyed. Claudia soon left Louis as he apparently could not sustain Claudia's spending habits and began binding and raping children during his lunch breaks. During this period Louis emphasised constant urges to molest children he encountered at work. In the autumn of 1980, he began 
carrying razor blades, candles and lighters to facilitate the torture of his victims. In addition, Louis removed a tooth to be able to bite children more effectively. Following his crimes, he wrote his victims' names in a blue notebook and prayed for them while pacing his room naked and beating his chest. Louis also compulsively read the Bible at night, attempting to find an explanation. Despite this, he developed an avid interest in tarot readings and Satanism after receiving a book from a friend. He would visit palm readers and other practitioners before concluding they also knew little regarding the occult. I personally don't know much about the occult and I'm a tarot reader. Afflicted with bouts of depression and guilt from from his crimes, Louis suffered nightmares about his victims, waking up in tears before entering fits of hysterical laughter as he remembered the pleasure he received from their pain. Discovering Adolf Hitler's book, Louis became fond of Hitler upon discovering similarities in their traumatic childhoods, homosexual experiences and years spent in vagrancy. This fondness developed into idolisation, expressing admiration for Hitler, mass, mass graves of the Holocaust and stating that he liked, quote, the con- concentration camps, end quote. On the 25th of January 1984, Louis was housed under psychiatric care for 33 days following a mental breakdown. He was prescribed uh, antipsychotic medication, referred to psychotherapy for his depression. After obtaining a permit to leave on the 28th of February 1984, Louis fled where he immediately molested, burned and bit two children before leaving with their photographs with his older sister. When the children publicly identified him, Louis fled again. He then resumed storing scalpels, candles and razor blades in plastic bags for future victims. Having molested and tortured more than a hundred children by this period, Louis was briefly detained for stealing jewellery from a friend. Louis also developed an obsession with a infamous murderer and Vietnam veteran who murdered his own mother and several others at a restaurant in December 1986. Louis admired the national attention it received and wished to emulate him as he and others noted it on television at a bar. From this point on, Louis harboured extensive fantasies of acquiring a machine gun and annihilating his father and family before committing suicide, holding various murders in great admiration. Louis felt that committing suicide along with mass murder of his family would be an ideal way to die. During this period, Louis found another girlfriend named, I'm just going to call her Grace, a single mother who resided 
near the local psychiatric centres in which he he was committed. After introducing himself, Louis casually suggested that she be his permanent companion. Charmed by his confidence, she let Louis live with her in exchange for providing meals and paying bills. Louis was generally absent, but acted as a protective and fatherly figure over the household. Despite this, Grace was wary of Louis' alcoholism, which often spurred scandalous and antisocial behaviour. Like Mary, Louis also would later claim that he loved Grace. After being seen drunk in the company of various youths of humble appearance by his friends, Louis' companions became aware of their friends' preferences. Despite this, Louis was not confronted and most of his acquaintances did not suspect any sexual problems. Starting in 1988, he began documenting his crimes, keeping trophies from his victims in black cloth suitcases at several female residences. Just a side note here, but I stated in the very beginning that his seven-year crime spree, I kind of want to reword that, but began from 1992 to 1999. And we are now heading into... 1990 so he's been getting away with this and as I said just a little while ago by the 1980s like somewhere in there he has harmed a hundred children now what's really tragic And again, coming from personal experience, my situation was very different. But that one incident that gave him, uh, I I don't know, um, so much, I don't even know the right words. He obviously gets a thrill out of it. Yet that one person, that one person's life has now been traumatised forever. And he's just going from victim to victim to victim. It's really, really devastating. Okay, so we're moving into the 1990s. Between 1980 and 1992... Louis was estimated to have raped and tortured a minimum of 200 youths, a period during which he had actively spent five years under psychiatric care, having attempted suicide several times. Where Louis had resided during this time, local reports of child abuse increased substantially. While operating a Ouija board, Louis alleged that he entered a state of psychosis in which the devil had asked him whether he would like to serve him. Answering that he would, the devil responded, saying, quote, kill that with killing many things may come. End quote. 
attempting to commit his first murder on October the 1st, 1992, Louis sought a young boy who had been selling sweets and cigars to passers-by. In a state of drunkenness, apparently, he lured the youth who he planned on bringing to a wooded lot before being interrupted and beaten by a lo- by local police, one of whom hit him over the head with a revolver. As Louis bled, they then stole 1,000 local currency in... in um, Columbia, a watch and a ring from him before letting him go from the police station. This obviously did not teach him anything. He first murdered 13-year-old Juan Carlos on the 4th of October 1992 and began wearing various disguises in order to evade identification and arrest. Known locally as Goofy, a generous man who who gave to children, locals went out of their way to keep documents for Louis. For years, Louis Louis documented his crimes by tickets, receipts, clothes, identity cards of the victims, all in a cloth black suitcase. Louis left the suitcase with his sister Esther before giving it to Mary. He also collected their amputated toes before disposing of them for fear that the Colombian National Police Scent Dog Team may trace them to him. In June 1996, Louis complained to Mary of losing his temporary job as a salesman for air fresheners, begging for a place to stay in exchange for food and financial relief. Wary of Louis for his binge drinking and his temper, she took him in briefly with hesitance. Louis then suffered a hard fall in the neighbourhood, breaking his leg in August 1996. Stricken with pain, He resided temporarily with a man before begging his girlfriend, Mary, to let him stay at her residence again. Restricted by having to use crutches, wear a neck brace and a cast, Louis resorted to begging on the street for the two months he resided with her. Louis provided for the household by paying for meals and other means, such as bringing a television. He remained hostile, however, and entered a fight with his girlfriend's 15-year-old son for wanting to watch the local news. Mary subsequently evicted Louis for this and for damaging a gold chain that she had gifted Louis Later that year, on Christmas Day, Mary received a gift from a visiting friend, which prompted an angry, drunken phone call from Louis, who stated that he, quote, didn't like those faggots, end quote, visiting as he feared they would steal her generosity from himself. After being informed he was no longer welcome, Louis appeared 
the next morning, shouting obscenities and threats while grabbing at Mary's throat, prompting her and the family to hide at a neighbour's house. After several hours, Louis left an apology note asking for forgiveness for his damage to their household. He was then nicknamed Conflict by locals. Louis was frequently seen drunk and drifting from town to town as he outwore his welcome. Often due to domestic disputes with co-workers, abuse to his girlfriends and general inability to behave normally. His erratic behaviour reportedly left him unable to develop and maintain close relationships. Towards the end of Louis's crime spree, he drifted through Western Columbia as a homeless drifter. Wary of murdering minors who he felt were much too easy to law. Louis developed plans to eventually commit a mass murder in which he would kidnap several adults and murder them as he attracted the attention of journalists, possibly dying in the frenzy. Nonetheless, Louis was detained for the attempted sexual assault of a 12-year-old John before being able to perform his mass murder on 22nd of April 1999. Louis began to feel empathy with his, for his sex crimes. On October the 4th, 1992, he had spotted 13-year-old Juan Carlos walking near a bazaar where he had been drinking. According to Louis, the reflection of the moonlight on the river had invoked a strange force within him, reminding him of his childhood and therefore enraged him. He followed the child, buying some synthetic rope and a butcher's knife on the way, before offering him work for 500 to 1,000 pesos, pesos, the, the currency, I'm sorry. Carlos, the child, left the crowded area with Louis to go to a remote area near the local railroad where he was later found with his front, front teeth knocked out, severe cuts to his rectum and throat, and his genitals severed. Louis alleged he blacked out and wept upon discovering the blood on his clothes in the morning. On the 10th of October 1992, Louis ventured to see his sister, Esther, drinking brandy to subdue his impulses. He began breaking containers in a state of rage after seeing a child pass by. Murdering 12-year-old Alexander on the way to his sister's residence. He further pursued and murdered youths collecting their amputated toes. In 1993, Louis started cutting into his victims' bellies, luring eight youths aged 9 to 11 from a local school to a nearby wooded lot. For fear of being traced by bloodhounds, Louis then discarded 
their amputated toes before murdering Henry, Marco, Juan, Jamie and three more unidentified children. He then murdered two additional children uh, and then fled the area. And then when he fled the area and settled into a new area, he murdered more children, ending his spree in 1993 with the death of 13-year-old Mauricio. In 1994, Louis Lord, estimated to be about 12 years old, and he had fallen asleep on the bus. After providing him with brandy, Louis stripped and bound the child at a secluded ravine spot and in a dazed state before noticing a foul odour. He then let the child go after discovering the source of the odour was a mass grave. Immediately, the child seized the knife, severing Louis's tendons in his left hand with the weapon before ultimately being overpowered and murdered. Brave child, brave child. On the 4th of February 1994, Louis lured a 13-year-old, Jamie, to a sugarcane field shortly after being expelled from a bar that night for complaining about their food. This is Jamie who is in the in the pub and he, he's been kicked out, okay? Um, then he crossed paths with Louis um, Encountering a large crucifix, he entered a brief psychosis and heard a voice berating him before burying his knife and praying for forgiveness. Retrieving the knife again and returning to his hotel room to chant scripture from the 57th Palm for several hours until dawn. On January 12th, 1997, Louis murdered eight-year-old boy before murdering an additional two minors during this period. So he ended up um, molesting and murdering Jamie, who was kicked out of the pub, then moved on to even more. The victims were almost exclusively boys, though Louis had noted by local media to have molested and murdered female victims. In addition to his 172 initial charges of murder, Louis also confessed to 28 more in 2003, of which five were adults. According to Louis, he ordered the killings of his adult victims. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, Louis was also said to have operated in Ecuador during the summer of 1998 when he murdered <coughs> when he murdered 14-year-old Abel, a, la- a local shoe shiner and paper boy on the 20th of July 1998 and 12-year-old Jimmy, also in Ecuador. Both boys were from poor families and disappeared at noon. Louis was subsequently spotted at an all-girls school in Ecuador before fleeing the authorities who had been setting up an operation to catch him. They there 
they found two bodies, one of whom was a young girl who had been raped, tortured, murdered and discarded in a similar fashion to that of Lewis's MO, which we're going to get into shortly. Marked for his thick Colombian accent, locals spotted a foreign drifter begging for money in July and August of that year. In addition, Louis also stated that he allegedly committed murder in Venice, Whaler. Now, I know this is pretty bad and horrific already but there are surviving victims William Mora in 1979 Louis Weldon and Machete seized victim nine year old William as he was about to join other playing children hugging him and threatening to kill him if he screamed. William obliged and he was escorted by Louis to an abandoned building where he was sexually molested and tortured for 12 hours. When Louis sensed that someone was near the house, he urged the child to remain silent. When Louis lost consciousness from drinking, William managed to escape. Carlos Alberto In the early 1990s, Louis would approach 10-year-old Carlos, offering him gifts and 200 pesos. I googled pesos in exchange for work. Louis led Carlos where he amicably spoke to the child. Upon reaching a secluded hill spot, Louis placed a knife at Carlos's throat before proceeding to bind, rape and torture him. After doing so, Louis asked Carlos whether he enjoyed it. Humiliated and fearful of Louis, Carlos stated that he liked it, prompting Louis to leave after stating, see you next week, that's how I like it. And that you also like it, end quote. How terrifying is that? Brand Bernal. Brand was a 16-year-old youth who worked with his father in the cockfighting business in the 1990s. While Brand tended to roosters in the cockpit, Louis took him to a secluded spot by threatening him with a knife. He then proceeded to bind, sexually assault and torture with methods ranging from stabbing seven times with a screwdriver as he raped him, to beating the youth until weak. Brand broke free from his restraints and fled. Uh, this is just how horrific and brutal Louis Garavito is and I I did warn you I was going to ruin your Sunday and I, I like it it's painful for me to read them and and say them out loud as it is for you to listen to them I guess but I put them in there and I keep the details in there to show the brutality behind what Louis is doing 
to these children is what I can't express enough. So with that said, I'm about to discuss his modus operandi, meaning his MO. And um, again, brutal and um, details. According to Louis, he primarily targeted children of humble backgrounds who were working class, homeless, peasants or orphaned. Louis would look for children and lure them away by bribing them with small gifts such as money, candy or odd jobs due to a, quote, force within him. He reportedly molested young boys with cute faces and green or blue eyes. Louis himself boasted of his penchant for innocent looking children with blondish skin and hair. Born and raised in the largely Spanish descended region of Colombia, Louis knew where to find victims to fit his criteria. Terrified of the dark, he would approach them in broad daylight in public places, ranging from the countryside to crowded city streets. Louis also drank brandy near school zones on evenings to wait for victims. He offered easy work for money and wore disguises, ranging from a Catholic priest to a school teacher, to an elderly man, to more effectively lure his victims. To prevent suspicions about his activities from developing, Louis would change his dis- disguise often. Once he had the trust of a child, Louis typically walked to a secluded spot or a mass grave site with the victim, encouraging them to talk about their personal life until they were tired and vulnerable, making them easier to handle. His words, not mine. After sipping about half a bottle of brandy, Louis bound the children, intimidating them with a knife as he fondled and sometimes masturbated over them. According to Louis, he made, quote, a pact with the devil and satanic rituals were also incorporated into the murders of the children who were apparent blood sacrifices. The children were often molested and tortured simultaneously for prolonged periods. Victims were stabbed with a screwdriver in the buttocks, hands and feet to having their buttocks flayed with broken blades that Louis had placed between his fingers graphic now. While alive, Louis severed their genitals and placed them in the child's mouth. They were extensively beaten, burned, trampled and often showed deep cuts in the back, belly and throat. In some cases they were sexually abused as their intestines poured out of the belly. Impaled through the anus and stabbed over a hundred times. He went all the way through. Oh dear. 
Louis' climax would occur when he had decapitated the child alive or cut the throat as he finished before leaving the severed genitals in the mouth of the severed head. Necrophilia with the victim's corpse was also occasionally involved in the crimes, sometimes prematurely, as Louis could only achieve orgasm by beating and stabbing his victims during intercourse. The children's bodies were all found completely naked, bearing bite marks and signs of extensive sodomy. Containers of lubricant were found near the bodies along with empty bottles of cheap Colombian brandy. Most of the bodies showed signs of prolonged torture. Investigation Beginning in the 1980s, miners from impoverished backgrounds and other groups termed disposable began disappearing rapidly from the streets of Colombia. Due to the decades-long civil war, victims were unlikely to be reported missing. A group of children discovered a skeleton while playing football on November the 7th, 1998. Yet authorities did not take much notice until the 15th of November when mass graves of as many as 36 children were uncovered, almost all of them boys, with signs of binding, sexual assault and prolonged torture. They discovered a total of 41 children and 27 children in the neighbouring town. This large number of missing children called for a widespread investigation as these killings were not confined to a specific area. The brutality was so fierce to authorities that they initially hypothesised the killings were performed by a satanic cult or an international child trafficking ring. In spite of this, The prosecutor's office soon determined that it was likely one man to be responsible due to the prevalence of nylon cord and liquor bottle caps found at all the crime scenes. On February 6, 1999, the bodies of two naked children were found lying next to each other on a hill near a sugarcane field. The next day, only metres away, they discovered another child's body. All three bodies had their hands bound and bore signs of sexual abuse. The victims' necks were severely cut and bruises on their backs, genitals, legs and buttocks. The murder weapon was found in the same area as the bodies. Louis had passed out partially naked on top of a child's body while drunk with a cigarette in his left hand, causing the cane field to catch fire. He burned himself severely in the process and left behind his money, burnt sunglasses, sorry, burnt glasses, shorts, shoes and underwear receipts and a note containing Grace's address was also found. From his glasses, the authorities were able to determine that the murderer was a middle-aged. His shoes also showed that he walked with a limp and stood five foot four, five foot six inches tall. They falsely arrested a local sex offender named Pedro, who was 44 and had a limp in his right foot. As two boys disappeared in his area, 
a young boy had outed him as the man who attempted to assault him. He was kept in jail until more children began to disappear. Meanwhile, the main detective had begun to suspect Louis as their wanted killer. Louis's girlfriend was contacted. She told police that she had not seen him since December. She did, however, give to the police a black cloth suitcase that Louis had left in her possession. This contained a number of his belongings. These items included pictures of young boys, detailed journals of his murders, tally marks of his victims and bills. This new information led them to Louis's residence, but the property was vacant. He was probably evicted again. Detectives believed that Louis was either travelling for work or away attempting to find his next victim. Okay, so the police released the guy they arrested, thinking it was it was him that was doing the crimes. Um, and they managed to track down the girlfriend and the sister of Louis. Louis was picked up by local police just days later on an unrelated charge of attempted rape. I'm not quite sure how that's unrelated. Normally when they say that, it's like drink driving. Um, Attempted rape against 12-year-old John. On the 22nd of April, 1999. That's tomorrow. I'm just putting that out there. The 22nd of April is tomorrow. Uh, 1999, Louis was drinking brandy in the evening when he encountered John selling lottery tickets in introducing himself as a local politician. Louis proceeded to seize John with a knife before threatening the child into silence. Pretending to hug John, Louis escorted him into a taxi before forcing him to climb a barbed wire fence that led to a secluded hillside. At this location, Louis proceeded to bind John while repeatedly screaming, am I a sadist? He then taunted the child with the blade, shouting various obscenities as he Mm. masturbated over him. A homeless 16-year-old had been close enough to hear the struggle between Louis and John. The teen began to curse and throw stones at Louis. Louis chased the teenager with his dagger. Both boys fled to a farmhouse Mm -hmm. nearby Mm -hmm. where they were met by a 12-year-old girl. Louis later reached the farmhouse, aggressively asking the girl for directions. She directed Louis into the woods where he became lost. The police were contacted, resulting in a search. Authorities found Louis walking out of the woods at approximately 7 p.m. as they urged angry locals not to get involved in the search. He gave them a false ID and claimed to be a politician. Despite this, they suspected the man to be Louis anyway. On the 4th of July 1999, their suspicion was confirmed. For Columbia's Justice Department, Louis's confession was not enough. Louis had an eye condition that was rare and only found in men in a particular age group. 
His glasses were specifically designed for his unique condition. These particular glasses were found at a crime scene. Louis also left behind bottles of brandy, his underwear and his shoes. DNA was found on the victims along with other items left behind. Police scheduled the entire jail where Louis was being detained to get an eye exam. The outcome of which would help the police pair the glasses to Louis. By making it mandatory for all the prisoners, it reduced Louis's suspicion and kept him from lying about his eyesight. His height was five foot five inches and limp were also crucial in connecting him to the investigators' findings. While Louis was out of his cell, detectives took DNA samples from his pillow and living area. The DNA found on the victims was a match to the DNA found in Louis' cell. Louis was interrogated for over 12 hours in October. A detective read aloud his crimes until he cried and explained that he would get drunk and look for young boys. He affirmed that he was not homosexual but was a victim of childhood sexual abuse and would rape young boys before murdering them. Confessing to about 140 children in various locations. He was found guilty of 138 of the 172 accounts. The others are ongoing. Louis was sentenced to 1,853 years and nine days in prison, the lengthiest sentence in Colombian history. However, Colombian law limits imprisonment to 40 years and because Louis helped police find the victim's bodies, his sentence was further reduced by 22 years. Louis served his sentence in a maximum security prison. He was held separately from all other prisoners because it was feared it was feared that he would be killed immediately. He could have become eligible for parole in twenty twenty three when he served three fifths of his sentence. In 2021, a judge blocked a request to release Louis early for good behaviour on grounds that he had not paid a fine for his victims. Louis remained hopeful, having expressed to Colombian Senator Carlos apparent plans to enter Colombian Congress. enter the ministry as a pen, Pentecostal pastor and marry a woman in the hopes that he would be able to help abuse children upon his release. <sighs> Louis suffered from severe eye cancer and leukemia which left him blind, weak and fatigued, requiring daily blood transfusions. He spent most of his time making handcuffs, earrings and necklaces in the medical unit of the prison. Psychiatrists diagnosed him with antisocial personality disorder and noted narcissistic 
pers personality traits. I'm no psychiatrist and I could have told you that. Louis died at hospital on the 12th of October 2023 at the age of 66. Which is again a blessing in disguise because he could have been up for parole in 2023. Can you imagine? That is, how do you get sentenced 1,853 years and then get it reduced by 22 when the cap is at 40? That's just infuriating. Many Colombians criticised the possibility of Louis' early release. In recent years, Colombians have increasingly felt that Louis' sentence was not sufficient punishment for his crimes. Some argued he either deserved life in prison or the death penalty, neither of which exist in Colombia. Colombian law had no provision or method to impose a sentence longer than what Louis received which was seen as a deficiency in the law caused by the failure to address the possibility of a serial killer in Colombian society. The law has since increased the maximum penalty for such crimes to 60 years in prison. There was a journalist who interviewed Louis for a show which was broadcast on the 11th of June 2006. He mentioned in the interview that Louis tried to minimise his actions and expressed intent to start a political career in order to help abused children. He also described Louis's conditions in prison and commented that due to good behaviour he could have probably applied for early release within three years. Three years for the devastation this man left behind him wherever he went. I mean, seriously. Isn't that just bad? There you go. I'm sorry. I ruined your Sunday. I gave you fair warning that I was about to. This is one of the most horrific cases that I have ever covered I mean it, it's just absolutely horrific so one thousand eight hundred and fifty three years and nine days That was in 2001, 835 years imprisonment in 2000, 22 years imprisonment in Ecuador. So even if he had survived, he would have been shipped over to Ecuador to serve that sentence. Maybe. Victims, 193 plus. Or 221 plus if 2003 confession is to be believed. 142 convicted. Up to 300 plus suspected. And he was apprehended on the 22nd of April 
1999 and here I am on the 21st of April in 2024 talking about him I just can't believe this dude As I always do, okay, as I always do, and I always like to pay a a special homage to all of the victims, known and unknown, and those victims that survived. I mean... I can't even imagine how you begin to put your life back together when someone does this and then says to you, I'll be back next week seeing you enjoyed it so much. You know, it's it's beyond evil. Uh, I don't believe that the devil told him to do it. I think he was just... I don't think anyone's ever born evil, and this is often a hot potato. Um, There is another case that I um, am going to talk about next week. Maybe I should leave it, actually, because it's not as gruesome as this one, but it does involve children. So maybe I should leave it and find something else. But he had a very child... very sad upbringing um you know i don't think you're born evil i think i don't know i I think it it's more nurture how you're brought up and the influences that happen but there you go guys um absolutely heartbreaking and horrific and my heart truly goes out to any and all of the victims and their families and the survivors I hope they are doing so much better and um yeah As always, guys, please do leave your thoughts and comments down below. This has been a very long one. And um, it's just heartbreaking. Truly, truly. This one's going to sit with me for a couple of days. I know it. Uh, Yeah, I I have... I'm working on my... um, I'm working on a few paintings all at once, but I'm primarily focused on uh, Child of Heaven. And I've nearly finished that now. Um, I'm on the very bottom row. So by Monday Night Live, I reckon I'll be done. I'm just trying to um, change gear to, to kind of just break that up because it's a lot. But... Yeah. Thank you for keeping me company. Did you make it to the end? You'll have to pop that in a sentence if you've made it to the end. Kudos. Kudos. Um, Very, very brutal. Thank you for keeping me company. And uh, I look forward to reading your thoughts and comments down below. And, uh, yeah, go do something fun now. Jeez. It's going to be a while before I shake this one off, I think. Horrific man. What What a horrific, horrific man. And right from the get-go, in in his childhood... 
could have all been turned around. Right. I'm off to diamond paint and, uh, yeah. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of uh, Murder, Mystery and Kitten Up Sunday. And I will be back next week. Any suggestions, please leave them down below and uh, I will get looking into them. Stay safe, guys. Stay safe out there, please. And I'll be seeing you next week. If not in my Monday Night Live, which I know not everyone is a fan of true crime. So I will ask, as I do sometimes, oh, did you catch her? Did you watch the true crime? Uh, I will not be going into details because, yeah, uh, that's for, for the true crime fanatics of us to sit and endure. And I've got to re-listen to this back and edit it. But that's okay. I will be seeing you next week or in my live tomorrow. Bye, guys.